Over the past week, I've been able to go hands-on with Apple's new late 2016 MacBook Pro refresh, the 13-inch model. This is the model that you can walk into an Apple store or a Best Buy location and pick up today. It is, of course, the model without the headlining touch bar feature. Now, that being said, there are still a lot of details that we can glean about Apple's refresh just by going hands-on with the touch barless 2016 MacBook Pro because despite the lack of a touch bar, there's still tons of changes that this machine shares with the touch bar enabled version. So let's have a look. So let's go ahead and unbox the MacBook Pro right now. Take the lid off here. Underneath, you'll see the MacBook Pro on top. We'll just set that aside for the time being. Underneath the machine, you'll find some documentation, including some stickers inside this little package here. You'll also find a 61 watt power adapter. Now this isn't your typical MagSafe power adapter. This is a USB-C enabled adapter and it comes with a USB-C two meter length cable inside the box. So MagSafe is no more and you don't get an extension cord. If you want an extension cord, you'll need to buy one separately at the Apple store. So taking off the plastic protector, here's the MacBook. We'll open the lid and we'll remove the screen protector. And there we go, ladies and gentlemen, the 13 inch MacBook Pro unboxed. While space gray seems to be a thing of the past as far as iPhones are concerned, the MacBook Pro now gets a color other than silver and that of course is space gray. Hey, I'll take it. Chassis. The most striking difference between the previous MacBook Pro and the late 2016 models is the styling and build of the chassis. The updated MacBook Pro is actually like a mesh between the 12 inch Retina MacBook and the previous generation MacBook Pro. Although it avoids going the tapered route, the device's chassis is smaller than its predecessor in all facets. It's thinner, takes up less horizontal and vertical real estate. It's also a half a pound lighter than the last generation model. And the bezels, those surrounding the screen and the keyboard are now smaller as well. And that allows the notebook to have a smaller form factor while retaining the same screen size and keyboard size. Another big difference has to do with the hinge that supports the screen on the back of the device. You'll no longer find that plastic black mesh point that's on the rear of the hinge. It's now all aluminum, just like the 12 inch MacBook. This ultimately affords a much more premium look and feel when the lid is closed. Bye bye MagSafe. The most conspicuous difference between this year's MacBook Pro charger and the previous generation charger is the lack of MagSafe, that handy magnetic connector that helped prevent accidental tripping hazards in the past. Now, how do you charge a MacBook Pro when there is no MagSafe connector? The answer is USB-C. That does everything, along with providing connections to peripherals. The USB-C ports can also be used to power and recharge the MacBook Pro's battery, and you can use any of the ports to do so. One thing that you will miss is the extension cable that used to come with Apple's MacBooks. There is a two meter USB-C cable included, which is nice, but that extension cable will be missed by some. Now, there are some obvious downsides by eliminating that dedicated MagSafe connector. The most obvious being the tripping hazards that you'll now have with the USB-C connection because it no longer automatically or easily detaches, I should say, if you happen to trip over that cable. Also, one other thing that the MagSafe connector provided was that nice little LED indicator to let you know when the MacBook was charging or when it was fully charged or when it wasn't charging. With USB-C charging cables, you lose those benefits as well. Now, I don't wanna make it seem like I'm totally raining on the USB PC parade because it does have a lot of advantages. It's capable of delivering power up to 100 watts, which is more than enough for the 61 watt adapter included with the 13 inch MacBook Pro. USB-C is also bi-directional, meaning that it can both send and receive power over the same port, and you can use any of the ports to charge your MacBook. We'll talk about more advantages of that USB-C connector in a few. Battery life. Apple is promising 10 hours of battery life for wireless web browsing and iTunes movie watching, and this is made possible by the 54.5 watt hour battery contained within this 13 inch MacBook Pro, which is actually slightly larger than the battery contained inside the 13 inch model with the touch bar. This coupled with the processor's lower TDP should result in better battery life than advertised, and I was actually able to get fairly good battery life. I was able to get around 13 hours just browsing a web and doing mundane tasks, no video editing or anything like that, but I was able to easily surpass Apple's 10 hour battery rating for this 13 inch model. Auto boot and startup chime. You're gonna notice some differences with the MacBook Pro when it comes to booting and startup. 
When you open the MacBook Pro's lid while it's powered off, the machine will now automatically boot. The same thing happens if you connect it to a power adapter while the lid is open or while the lid is closed but connected to an external display. It is possible to disable the MacBook Pro's auto boot feature via some handy terminal flags though. And as a result of the auto boot feature, the startup chime has been disabled. If you miss that sound, which occurs when you boot your Mac, it's a kind of iconic at this point, we show you how to re-enable that startup chime in a post on 9to5Mac. MacBook Pro Text makes a comeback. Some people might not like this change, but like it or not, the MacBook Pro Text is back on the bottom of the display bezel. This text, which was removed during the previous generation years, is back in full form on the late 2016 models of MacBook Pro. Now, the 12-inch MacBook has always had this MacBook text below its screen, which should have been a sign that this text was right for a comeback, but there is a noticeable difference between the font on the 12-inch MacBook and the new MacBook Pro. The font used on the new MacBook Pro is now San Francisco regular, instead of myriad light like on the 12 inch model. No glowing Apple logo. 12 inch MacBook users will already be accustomed to this change, but those of you who grew fond of the glowing Apple logo on previous generation MacBook Pros will be sad to see that it is no more. The glow was made possible by the backlight of the display, but since Apple's latest MacBook displays are so thin, that glowing logo had to be scrapped for a color matched inset logo, in this case, a space gray. Speed. The base 13-inch MacBook Pro with function keys includes a 2 GHz Intel Core i5 with 8 GB of RAM. All 13-inch models of the MacBook Pro lack discrete graphics, but the low-end model sports an Intel Iris 540 integrated GPU and features a power-sipping 15-watt TDP. In other words, don't expect this machine, whose dual-core processor can turbo up to 3.1 GHz, to run at high speeds for an extended amount of time. That said, there are upgrade options for the entry-level 13-inch MacBook Pro. You can upgrade the processor up to an i7, you can upgrade the RAM to 16 gigabytes, and there are additional flash storage capacities. But those in the market for this MacBook, I think they will stick with the stock configuration most of the time. So I did do a few benchmarks you can see here. Nothing spectacular for the 13-inch MacBook Pro, pretty pedestrian scores there for single-core and multi-core. I did do a 5K test with Final Cut Pro though, and you can see it definitely beats the 12 inch MacBook. So if you need this for Final Cut Pro, it's actually pretty decent. Graphics wise, no surprise here, the Intel Iris 540 is not impressive at all. In fact, the iPad Pro is pretty much neck and neck with it. The most impressive thing about this machine from a performance perspective is with the disk read and write speed. The new SSD is just ridiculously fast on all models across the entire Pro lineup. And I think you're gonna be very happy by what you get here when it comes to disk read and write speeds. As you guys know, the new MacBook Pro basically features no ports. Okay, it, it features two ports. It features two Thunderbolt 3 ports, which have the USB-C form factor, and it includes a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, which is sort of ironic given the iPhone 7 situation right now. But a lot of ports have been axed on this new MacBook Pro. You no longer get an SD card reader. You no longer get USB-A, which are legacy ports. You no longer get Thunderbolt 2 or mini display port. You no longer get HDMI. So that's a lot of ports to kill off in one revision. And the response has been very negative. In fact, it's been so negative that Apple has been compelled to reduce the price of its USB see adapters and its dongles uh, but I think that ultimately this is the right decision it's just so early it's sort of the chicken egg scenario where customers don't own USB-C peripherals and manufacturers don't make that many and the ones they do make are kind of unreliable right now because everything's just so new uh, this will undoubtedly change in the future but it's going to take Apple forcing everyone's hand to accelerate this change and change is painful the transition will be painful customers will have to spend more money on dongles and companies will have to produce reliable accessories that actually work but Apple is obviously very bullish on the potential and power of Thunderbolt 3 and rightfully so. Thunderbolt 3 is a do-all interface that rolls almost everything, including power delivery, into a single port. Apple removed a lot of ports, but the good news is that the ports it did add, although there are only two on a 13-inch entry-level MacBook Pro, the ports that it did add are extremely flexible. They can be daisy-chained, they're super powerful. This cannot be understated. Thunderbolt 3 is basically a new era of computing. It's gonna take some time, but in the end, this technology has the potential to greatly simplify our desktop work areas while providing flexibility that we didn't have in the past. Now granted, you only get those two Thunderbolt ports instead of the four that you get on higher end models, but the good news is that both ports are wired to Intel's Alpine Ridge Thunderbolt 3 controller, so this means that both ports offer full PCIe 3.0 bandwidth. 
So if you're coming from a machine like the MacBook with one single USB-C 3.1 Gen 1 port, this is gonna be a major improvement. Not only do you get two Thunderbolt ports, capable of 40 gigabits per second when connected to Thunderbolt 3 peripherals, but you also get that USB-C Gen 2 port, which is capable of connecting to USB peripherals at 10 gigabytes per second for those devices that support USB 3.1 Gen 2. And Thunderbolt 3 on the 13-inch MacBook Pro means that you can connect up to two 4K displays at 60 hertz or a single 5K display at 60 hertz. Now, there is still a lot of confusion and a lot of incompatibilities with some of the, the monitors and some of the accessories out there. So it's gonna take a while before things settle down and you're really gonna start being able to develop a real serious workflow with Thunderbolt 3, but the foundation has been laid and it is very exciting. Improved display. The great thing about the MacBook Pro refresh is that all models, including the entry-level model, has a better P3 wide color display. Slowly but surely, Apple's beginning to roll out wide color displays across its entire product line, and the MacBook Pro is the latest such device to receive that wide color display. The difference is a 25% increase in available colors, making images that support wide color appear to pop on screen with more vibrant greens and vibrant reds. And thanks to a brighter 500 nit LED backlight, the MacBook Pro's display is also the brightest display that Apple has ever shipped in a Mac notebook. Contrast ratio has improved as well. It's now 67% higher than the previous generation, which will help deliver much brighter whites and deeper blacks. Across the board, the display is noticeably better than any MacBook display that we've seen thus far. Keyboard. When I heard Phil Schiller describe the MacBook Pro's keyboard on stage, I was a little worried because it sounded an awful lot like the 12-inch MacBook's keyboard, which is polarizing to say the least. The problem with the keyboard on the 12-inch MacBook is its lack of key travel, and while the new MacBook Pro does indeed feature similar key travel, I can confirm that the keyboard is still much improved. The new MacBook Pro features the same wider key design with the new butterfly switches, but the switches are a second-generation variety that lends a significantly better typing feel. The new keyboard provides slightly higher raised keys, more key stability and a more satisfying sense of spring force. You know, that feeling when the key returns from its position after being pressed. If there's not technically more key travel on the new MacBook Pro's keyboard, it certainly feels like there is. The keyboard on the 12-inch machine feels like you immediately bottom out with each key press, whereas the MacBook Pro's keyboard feels much more like a mix of the Magic Keyboard and the 12-inch MacBook keyboard. The main difference is that the keys sit higher, which means that they don't sit as flush to the machine's chassis. This coupled with the improved response of the keys makes touch typing noticeably better. That's not to say that the new keyboard won't take some getting used to for those completely new to the butterfly key switches, but I think most people will enjoy typing on it once they get used to it. Larger trackpad. The new 13-inch MacBook Pro features a considerably larger trackpad when compared to the previous iteration of the machine, and as it's been for several years now, the trackpad is a force touch enabled variety, which means it's no longer a mechanical button that clicks, but it's a force sensitive area that utilizes haptics and sound to simulate clicks. If you're coming from a MacBook that already has force touch, then outside of the more generous surface area, you'll know exactly what to expect. However, if it's been a while since you've upgraded your MacBook and you're coming from a mechanical trackpad, it's going to take some time to get used to the new feel. The wonderful thing about the Force Touch trackpad is that you can click anywhere on the surface and the click's going to register. And since the entire surface is pressure sensitive, clicks are going to feel the same no matter where you press. Unlike previous MacBooks with Force Touch trackpads, you can no longer disable the audible click via macOS's system preferences, which is weird to me. I don't understand why Apple disabled that function. One last tidbit is that the three finger drag gesture, which you now have to go into the accessibility preferences to enable, doesn't seem to work as reliably on my machine. It could be a hardware issue, I guess, or it could be a software issue. I can't say for sure at this point. I haven't tested out another MacBook to, to determine whether that is the case, but it's just something that you should keep in mind. Hopefully it's a software issue that Apple can update with the future version of Mac OS. Louder speakers. One of the biggest changes to the new MacBook Pro has to do with speaker output. The new speakers provide a 58% increase in volume, twice the dynamic range and more than twice the bass. Apple says that its speakers are connected directly to system power, which enables up to three times more peak power when required. And these aren't just bullet points that sound good on paper, as you'll hear a marked difference in sound quality over the previous generation MacBook Pro. So who should consider buying this machine? The most obvious buyers that come to my mind are those who may be considering an upgraded 12-inch MacBook. As you can see from some of the benchmarks, the new MacBook Pro runs circles around my 1599 M5 equipped MacBook. 
If you're considering the 12 inch MacBook for any other reason besides form factor or its fanless architecture, then you'd probably be much better off with the 13 inch MacBook Pro. The base entry level MacBook Pro is cheaper than the upgraded 12 inch MacBook and offers a better processor, better screen, keyboard, trackpad, dual Thunderbolt 3 ports, etc. Another potential audience for this MacBook Pro are those who, for whatever reason, want absolutely nothing to do with Apple's new Touch Bar or Touch ID. With the 13-inch entry-level MacBook Pro, you get access to the newest hardware without having to sacrifice their traditional function keys. MacBook Air owners, on the other hand, who are wanting to upgrade to a new Mac laptop, have an obvious choice with the entry-level 13-inch MacBook Pro, but the $1499 asking price might scare those buyers away. MacBook Air owners looking for a better screen and a machine with a bit more power might consider the last-generation 13-inch MacBook Pro, which Apple is still selling, for $1299. If you can swing the $1499 asking price, I think you'd probably be better off saving a little bit longer to get a MacBook Pro with Touch Bar. Not only do you get to experience Apple's latest hardware innovation, but it'll also deliver faster speeds over a significantly longer time due to its 28 watt TDP. All of that said, this machine seems to be in a weird spot. It's too expensive for MacBook Air owners to upgrade with no questions asked, and it lacks the touch bar and the power to make it worth it for those willing to depart with the additional cash. It's certainly not a bad machine by any stretch of the imagination, it's just a little boring and a bit more expensive than I think is justified. But this machine, for all of its shortcomings, gives us an intimate look at what's next for Apple laptops. The changes to the screen and chassis are significant and paint a picture as to what we'll likely see from Apple over the next few generations of MacBook Pro hardware. What do you think? Is the entry-level 13-inch MacBook Pro worth it? Let me know what you guys think down below in the comment section. This is Jeff with 9to5Mac.